The Center for Educational Media and the College of Education at Middle Tennessee State University are proud to offer professional development to K-12 educators in Tennessee through our online video library. These videos are aligned with standards set by the Tennessee Department of Education. For more professional development videos, check out our website at cem.mtsu.edu. Time for our first activity. Uh, now that we have geography and maps of early Tennessee on the brain, this is great because we're going to take a more in-depth look at a couple uh, different ones. So we're going to talk about Cumberland Gap, uh, wilderness Road and their impact on early settlement. And uh, Library of Congress doesn't have a, a whole ton of primary sources on those things. Now, it does have sources that were created after that time period that we're talking about. Uh, so those aren't exactly primary sources for the 18th century, but we'll, we'll bring that up later too. So um, it really starts, or I'm going to start talking about it in the context of the proclamation of 1763, uh, which was one of the consequences of the French and Indian War, where this line, and of course lines are, <laughs> they're not created on the landscape, they're only created on maps. And so it's not like anything that people on the ground can see or even know exactly where it is. So I always think it's funny this idea of boundaries on maps. Uh, but here is one that was created, the proclamation line of 1763 between uh, this orange and this kind of peach colored uh, sections here. So what was the purpose of this line? Do you remember? So you were not supposed to expand past that. Yeah, who wasn't supposed to expand uh, past colonist. that? Colonists. Right. Right, so here you have all the colonists uh, in the English colonies, the Eastern Seaboard, and as we saw with Dr. Busey's talk, I mean, the whole story of the United States is just expand west, expand west. Uh, and this is supposed to stop that. Um, and so what's on the other side of this line? Uh, this is where the Native American tribes were trying to be like, you know, keep out. So what do you think happened? They ignored it. Who ignored it? The colonists. The colonists. The colonists ignored it. I'm sorry. Yes, exactly. And did they uh, ignore it on purpose? Did they ignore it by accident? <laughs> oh, probably a lot of both. Um, but mostly on purpose, I'm sure. Um, so what kinds of geographical features do you think that this line covers? This is the Appalachian Mountains. Mountains, for sure. Okay, yeah, so those would be kind of along all the way. Actually, they go all the way up to Maine, don't they? So here you have this line, and you're just setting up people to break it, right? Uh, and so enter in uh, the, the Wilderness Road. And, uh, but here's an example of a person who's going to break it. <laughs> and this is a letter that's written by... None other than, I don't know if you can make that up. Washington. George Washington. Yes. And don't worry, I'm not going to make you read this, but there is a section of this letter uh, that we are going to take a look at. And here it is. So um, the other matter just now hinted at in which I proposed in my last to join you in attempting to secure some of the most valuable lands in the king's part which I think may be accomplished after a while, notwithstanding the proclamation that restrains it at present and prohibits the settling of them at all, for I can never look upon that proclamation in any other light, but this I say between ourselves, than as a temporary expedient to quiet the minds of the Indians and must fall, of course, in a few years especially when those Indians are consenting to our occupying the lands. Any person, therefore, who neglects the present opportunity of hunting out good lands and in some measure marking and distinguishing them for their own, 
in order to keep others from settling them, will never regain it. If therefore you will be at the trouble of seeking out the lands, I will take upon me the part of securing them so soon as there is a possibility of doing it, and will moreover be at all the cost and charges of surveying and patenting, etc. Because he was a surveyor, you know. After which you shall have such a reasonable proportion of the whole as we may fix upon at our first meeting, as I shall find it absolutely necessary and convenient for the better furthering of the design to let some few of my friends be concerned in this scheme and who must also partake of the advantages. Now that's a mouthful. And I doubt your fifth graders or even your high schoolers are going to have an easy time figuring out what that says. So I would just recommend <laughs> you uh, paraphrasing it to the class, uh, pointing out specific phrases. So what would be a couple of the key phrases here that you would want to point out to them to get to the gist of what George Washington is saying about the proclamation of 1763? Well, that it's only temporary. It's temporary. Yeah. A temporary expedient. And so this is the place where your students learn what temporary expedient means. And I'm sure that they have experienced this from their parents a lot, but just didn't know that's what it was called, right? OK, and so what is he proposing that people do? Let's go ahead and go hunt and find our good spots and stake claim now before everybody else gets to. Yeah, and there's that word opportunity again. Of course, it's spelled slightly differently. Um, and this is the whole driving force, really, behind settlement. I see an opportunity. If we don't take this up, somebody else is going to get it. So it's more important to snatch this opportunity than to abide by this. It's really just, they just did this to, to appease the Indians. But look, a, a lot of the Indians, they don't mind. A lot of them don't mind if we come, right? I don't know if I don't know if he's actually right in saying that or not, but I'm sure this was an argument that people used to justify their actions. So yeah, this is uh, this is the attitude of George Washington. So uh, you can imagine that a lot of other people followed suit, and I actually um, I'm going to show you that letter is linked. Uh, where it says original document, and here's the excerpt that was transcribed from that as part of this feature on the Library of Congress teachers page called American uh, Memory Timeline. And so this timeline has different primary sources it pulls out for each era of American history. So this was a letter that he wrote to his pal William Crawford in 1767. So this is is before he's president. This is for the Revolutionary War. So this is where he's a, a land surveyor and he's getting rich off of this, right? Um, and it also makes him very familiar with the lay of the land, which helps out when he's a general. Um, so this is, this is what is going on. And in the context of don't settle past this line, oh, but we're going to anyway. So how do you convey people into these new lands that are opening up? This is where the Wilderness Road comes in. So um, people like Daniel Boone. And Daniel Boone, yes, he was a long hunter. He was also hired by a company to go out and scout out lands to see you know, what they were like and how to get people there. And this is from a portion of the uh, Library of Congress website, which if you're not already familiar with this one and you teach fifth grade, then you should be because it's really nice. America's Story, uh, this is totally for fifth grade reading level and they have a lot of different features on it. Anyway, so this is just a couple short years after that letter that we just read. Daniel Boone is finding his way into Kentucky and this is how he gets there, the Wilderness Road. So he's one of the prime movers in this new settlement uh, pathway. And I got this map from the website of National Historic Park. This is a really good way to find resources is if there's a state park or a national park or wilderness area or battlefield or whatever, go to the National Park Service website and you should be able to find some good things that you can use in the classroom. So that's where I got this. And this is a nice map that shows um, 
where the Wilderness Road picks up from the Great Valley Road and goes into Tennessee territory and hits the Cumberland Gap there and then, you know, turns right into Kentucky. And here's another look at it. Oh, right. This is to show you. Um, I'm going to superimpose on this the map that we saw earlier. Yeah, this kind of matches up. So you can see where the, the Wilderness Road is. We are way far off the map now. We are way far past that proclamation line. No return. And so here's another one of the maps from the uh, Park Service website. It's a close-up where you can see the saddle of the gap where the Wilderness Road actually goes through the mountain range. So the topography, ma uh, the topography is visualized on this map when it really is harder to see on the other. So you can see this is the best place where you can get through. And I am the kind of person that I always go into Google Maps and I always try to look in both like the map view and the satellite view to see like what does this look like today? Can I see it? You know, from an aerial view, can I see? Because remember the, the, the way that the land is shaped has a really big impact on the way the state gets settled. And so the fact that there is a gap there is of utmost importance. Now, because I believe in context and because I believe in content, um, there are a couple things that I'm gonna pass out that you can give your students in terms of learning about the Wilderness Road, what it is, when it was um, created, and that kind of thing. So these serve the same purpose. They're from two different sources. I wanna give you one of each so you have it and you can choose and you can see. The first is an entry on the Wilderness Road from the Tennessee Encyclopedia of History and Culture, which is an online encyclopedia just about everything that has to do with Tennessee history and culture is going to have an entry there written by scholars, including Dr. Busey, from across the whole state and beyond. So has anyone ever used the Tennessee Encyclopedia? Yeah. Good. This is excellent, especially for high school level readers. Um, and so we link to a lot of these entries in our lesson plans and in our newsletters. I mean, you could go to Wikipedia, sure, but uh, this one is, uh, was edited and published by um, UT Press and the Tennessee Historical Society, and my boss was for a time the editor of it. Now, the other one is a content essay written for teachers by the resident teacher at the time working with the East Tennessee Historical Society, specifically for curriculum materials. So if you've ever gone to teach Tennessee history, uh, that website is great. Lisa Oakley and her crew do a fantastic job and we partner with them whenever we can. And they're in East Tennessee, so their East Tennessee, early Tennessee resources are particularly good. So I'm not saying you have to read both of them. <laughs> they have a really excellent lesson plan on secession. Oh yeah? Yeah, they do. They, but the, so they, they're really good about giving these kind of content essays as a way to, um, if you want, you can give your students to read for background or you yourself can read for background to help you uh, with your class discussion. So take some time uh, to read one of these or skim both of them uh, as you wish to learn more about the Wilderness Road and then we will come back to our activity. Okay, so I'm gonna ask the, the who, what, when, where questions first. Um, so, who was instrumental in creating the Wilderness Road? Daniel Boone. Daniel Boone. Okay. When? It's Dr. Thomas Walker. Dr. Thomas Walker, right. And, and when was this? 1750 to 1775. All right. So, this was actually starting before uh, that, that letter that we looked at earlier, and it, this is something that continually gets more and more uh, carved out. And um, where? <laughs> we already saw it on that. Uh, why? Settle, opportunity. <laughs> opportunity, this is gonna be our answer to everything now, right? <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay, and so, and then the question that we always um, force our graduate students to make sure they know how to answer is, what is the significance of this historic site? It enabled the settlement of Middle Tennessee. For us, that's the important part. Right. Right. So, I mean, because settlement in East Tennessee, uh, 
they were coming through a different way. This is, this is how we get to Middle Tennessee, by bypassing the Highland Rim and uh, going into the fertile area of the Central Basin. Um, okay, excellent. Now, oh yes, here is another look. Um, there's so many, of course, these are meant to be driving maps also when you are at the park, and so that's uh, another reason they have these modern routes on them, and you can actually drive part of the route, which is pretty cool. The green shaded part is the part set aside to be the park, so you can see it follows the ridge line. It's, it's funny because you can see that the, when the railroad comes in later, the railroad, of course, has to go through here. That's the green line. Uh, so everything has to kind of fit in this tiny little gap right there. And it, it becomes very strategic during the Civil War, of course, but we're not going to talk about that right now. Now, I have two maps. Uh, I'm going to divide you into four groups because I have two copies of each map. And so each group is going to get a copy of a map, and you're going to put it together because it's in pieces. Now, this means... And this is good because you have to get up anyway for lunch. I'm going to make you get up right now, and I'm going to make you clear your desks and move tables together because these maps are large. So, uh, see, each group is going to get one of these, and you have to puzzle them together. So, uh, in that case, um, can we have you three be a group? You three up here be a group. You three there be a group, and then the back row be a group. Because we need three groups of three and one group of four. Uh, so, uh, blank. Okay, that's right. No, yeah. that's right. That's right. It's going together. Yeah. So this is. Shut up, Matt. My looks. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Have you found the Cumberland Gap? So this is like where Nashville-ish will be. So, the, so it's going to be east be... of that or northeast of that. Let's all look at the first one of these. When do you think this map would have been created? Do you have an idea? It's got to be, you know, obviously pre-revolution. So maybe even in the 1750s or a little earlier. Okay, so what makes you think that this is an early map? Because Virginia is claiming half of the South. Okay. All right, because where is Tennessee? That's not on the map. It's not, it's not on the map. Right, the name Tennessee is not on the map. Of course, Tennessee, we all know, is on the map. Okay, so when do you think this map was created? Mid-1700s, maybe? Maybe mid 1800s. Yeah, that's like mid. This is later, and what makes you think that this one's later? Oh, yeah. Well, you see Nashville. Yeah. Right, because we have all the cities, and we know this is this is a map of the Bureau of American Ethnology. So I'm going to click on these so you can see the bibliographic pages. This one was created in 1778 in London. This is in the midst of the war. Why do you think they would need to publish a map like this in London in 1778? Okay. Good. And this one is part of a very large book that has lots of different maps in it. So this one is 1899. It's like something to do with Indian nations. Yes. This is all about Indian land sessions. So this is 1899. That's a time in our country when finally Pretty much all Native American threats are taken care of, and we can write about it. <laughs> and so this is, like I said, how hard it is to find primary sources for early Tennessee. That map is not a primary source for early Tennessee because it wasn't created during the period of early Tennessee. So that's something that you'll want to make sure that your students know. Um, this, however, is a primary source because it was created in 1778. So I, I asked them to find where the Cumberland Gap was on here. It's not labeled Cumberland Gap. Did you guys find it on there? Uh, Up here somewhere. Yeah. Cumberland, right there. Cumberland. Forward so theoretically. that map, I think, complements well the maps we saw earlier from Dr. Busey about the growth of white settlement at the expense of Indian settlement. 
So what kinds of things can you say about Indian land sessions from looking at that map? Some of the land sessions actually had geographical separations. To so see one land, it might be 100 or 200 miles apart from another section from the same people. Yeah. Like you see a three is here and three is here. And that would be one cessation or session, mm -hmm. uh, section. Right. I think you just showed the population like, of the Native Americans in Tennessee. Yeah. I mean, to show that a lot of the state was eventually given over, you know. Yeah. And one thing I like about it's being um, a newer map uh, compared to this one is that uh, students can see these cities and places that they've been or that they know about and be like, oh, well, I live in smack dab in the middle of this particular Indian land session. And so they can think about where was it that their land came from. In the other uh, lesson idea that looks at a couple other old maps uh, that are uh, come a little bit after this one, uh, one of the activities is to have your students pretend they're settlers and kind of draw a line of how they would have done it, whether by land, by river, um, if they just would have come in and stopped at the first like foothill that they saw, how far they would have gone, and that kind of thing as a way to get students to really pay attention to geographical features. Because one thing, when you're looking at maps that are more modern, like that one back there, the features are more political. You've got the names of cities, you've got these boundaries that are determined by entities in the federal government. Whereas here, we don't have as many of those yet because it's less explored, it's less claimed, and so you have more of an emphasis on the geographical features. It's like when you ask somebody for directions to a store and they're like telling you, you pass the farm and at the big tree you turn as opposed to go 0.5 miles and turn on Oak Elm Street or whatever. Um, it's a different sense of how you read the land and this is by geographical features. So you can have your students point out all the things on here that are geographical features, um, including not just rivers and mountains, but all the other little uh, things as well. And on that one, they're more um, cities, towns, blockhouses. Um, there are rivers on that one though, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are there any railroads on that or not? Some roads are mentioned. Some roads? Mm -hmm. Like the Cumberland Road is mentioned, but. Yeah. Well, that's good. There are roads on this one too, right? Where are the roads? This says road. Here's Warrior's Path. Yeah, there's a road. The roads are these tiny little lines or dotted lines. Here's a road. So it goes to show you what kind of transportation is dominant. And this is the kind of thing that a surveyor does. And that's the kind of thing that a government does, right? So also talk about different kinds of purposes of the maps. This is not from a lesson plan or a lesson activity that's already written down somewhere. Uh, this is just like a couple maps that I thought would be cool to compare. So there aren't like um, a, a set of predetermined questions for you to ask your students when looking at these maps. But what kinds of things would you want them to look at or notice? Bodies of water. Yes. And where are the bodies of water on this one? The river, the river, Mississippi River, Great Lake Lakes. Erie, Lake Michigan. Mm -hmm. I think it would be really cool for them to notice like how tiny Maryland is and how Indiana is way over here, but it ended up way over here. Yeah. Ah! <laughs> yeah. Right. And then here's Illinois country right here. I think it would be important to show them how these, the, all the confluence of these mountains are going to be a pretty big barrier to settlement. Yes. Now, it's like when you're driving towards Chattanooga on I-24 and you see this wall of mountains and you're like, how am I going to get through that wall of mountains? And then the closer you get, all of a sudden, oh, it's not. It's two walls and there's like a little gap. And you're like, oh, that's how I'm going to get through. Imagine if you were on foot with like a, whack, a wagon and you're like a wall of mountains. Okay, what am I gonna do? And you don't even know, like, wouldn't you? You know there's a gap because somebody told you, obviously you're not just Daniel Booning it. 
Um, that would be that would be silly with a wagon. Now, again, very very few primary sources from the time period of Cumberland Gap, so we have to deal with these later images. And these, uh, this one is from the Civil War era, for good reason because Civil War. Um, during the Civil War, like I said, the Cumberland Gap is very strategic because that's how you get things through. And so it was fought over uh, by the Union Confederacy. And so here is a view of that. And so this is a way to get your students to go from aerial view down into like street view, um, which I would just go ahead and do that on Google Maps. That's what I, that's what I do too. So here is one view of it. And so this is, uh, you can have them kind of take different forms of media like the images and the maps and, and kind of compare it. Here's another one also from the Civil War era that has a few more features uh, where you can see the encampments of um, uh, the Union occupation forces and all the tents. Uh, and the gap is very, very clear here. <laughs> Whereas it's, it's, it's not so, it's not quite as clear on the other one. And then here's a, one of these like postcards from the mid 20th century uh, where you have your meandering road that goes to the top uh, as an overview, uh, but then you can see where the gap is off to the right. So again, different views from the ground and showing you kind of the impact of geography and how that affects transportation.